Vernon and Holly, I just want to thank you for being a voice for individuals who are yet to have a voice. It amazes me how many, so many people in our society who are so pro-abortion are already born. It makes no sense. And I praise God for people like you on the front lines. And I'm not surprised how God poured out his blessing, probably blessed you in ways you never even dreamed that he would. That's because we're on the right side. It's always right to do right. Always. I don't care what culture says. Right is right. And I praise God for that truth that y'all herald every day at your facility. So good to see each of you this morning. I want to ask, how many of you in here have ever been knocked in the stomach by fist? Can I see your hand? Wow. It's a more violent group than what I had anticipated this morning. <laughs> I thought there'd be two people in here. I'm not going to ask how many of you have knocked the wind out of someone with a fist. I'm afraid the numbers would go up. <laughs> how many of you have ever had the wind knocked out of your sails by an event? Wow, that's a lot of hands. I think both, most of you that have been hit with a fist or an event would tell you that an event can leave you as breathless as a fist. When Amy, my middle daughter, in fact, she's here today with her two young children, was a year and a half old, we took her to the hospital. She was very ill, only to hear the doctor say, we don't know if your daughter's going to make it. That was an event that punched us in the gut. I'll never forget the morning my father called me to tell me my grandmother had been murdered. That was a punch in my gut. Or... The day my doctor said, you have leukemia, that was a punch in the gut. We are living, I think most of you would agree, in very discouraging times. You can't pick up a newspaper. I don't know if anybody reads a newspaper anymore, but if you do pick up a newspaper, it's depressing. If you turn on the news, it's depressing. It seems like everywhere we turn, the news is very discouraging. I remember when I began ministry 44 years ago, I sat down with an older gentleman who was finishing up his 60th year of ministry. And I asked him, I said, hey, I said, what is it that you know today about your congregation that you wish you'd known 60 years ago? I'll never forget what he said. He said, I wish I'd have known when I started out how discouraged that the overall population of our church is at any given time. He said, I believe it's as much as 70% of my congregation at any given time is discouraged about something. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand this morning, but I have a sneaky suspicion that if I wrote you a note or made a call or sent you a text or an email to encourage you, there's a 70% chance that it would come at the right time. We are living in incredibly discouraging days, and I am very aware of it. It is one of the greatest tools of Satan. He uses it both on the redeemed and the unredeemed. It is a tool that he uses over and over and over again because I believe Satan understands what discouragement can lead to. You see, ladies and gentlemen, discouragement can lead to depression Depression can lead to despair, and despair can lead to death. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone who is discouraged takes their life. That's not what I'm saying. But many people that I've talked to that contemplated taking their life said it began down a pathway of discouragement and depression. And so this morning, I wanted to share with you a message I simply have entitled, The Dangers of Discouragement. Whether you know it or not, Discouragement can be a very dangerous stage of life to stay in for any length of time. And then I want to share with you something that was written hundreds of years after this text that we're going to look at this morning in 1 Kings chapter 19. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn there if you would. As you know, we're finishing up a series on the life of Elijah. Uh, Several weeks ago, we began 
with Elijah being introduced as Elijah the Tishbite. That's all we know. Meaning that Elijah came from a little town by the name of Tishbe. It is only mentioned six times in the Old Testament, but they're all related to Elijah. So we really know nothing about him. But we, stand, we see him standing in the court of a very pagan king by the name of Ahab and preaching, thus saith the Lord. Then the next scene, we have him sitting beside a brook that dries up. Then the next scene, we see him on Mount Carmel praying the fire of God down on his life. Another high point. But this morning, we're going to see Elijah at the lowest point of his life. So do you understand, ladies and gentlemen, that even for men and women of God, life is a roller coaster? Have you lived long enough to understand that? One moment we're here, one moment we're there, next moment we're here, next moment we're there. That's life. Whether you are the redeemed or you have no relationship with God whatsoever, that's just a part of life. And I've always noticed in my own life that my most discouraging moments come after some of my greatest spiritual highs. In other words, I come home after a mission trip or speaking at a conference, and I often find myself drained. I often find myself without gas in the tank, and I find that in those days, I am very susceptible to being discouraged and depressed. But I'll also tell you this, I'm being very transparent. After seeing God do great things in my life is after that a time that I am the most susceptible to sin. Satan hits me hard every time I see major God events in my life. It has never failed. But it's the same thing here with Elijah. Every time he experienced God supernatural moments, Satan hit him right after that. And that's what we're going to understand this morning. You better know when you are the most susceptible to being discouraged, you're the most susceptible to sin, because let me tell you something, Satan does. And you better understand that as well. So I want us to take a look this morning at the text in 1 Kings chapter 19 and begin with verse 1. The Bible says that Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he killed all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and he arose and he ran for his life and he came to Beersheba which belongs to Judah and he left his servant there. So I want you to understand, he's just experienced the fire of God falling upon the nation of Israel. But right after that, after having killed 850 pagan prophets, Jezebel said, send a message to Elijah. And you tell him, I am not going to sleep. I am not going to eat. I'm going to do nothing until that boy is dead by this time tomorrow. And so he ran. I, in verse 2, I, I can't help... But remember that little slogan? How many of you have heard the little slogan, there is no fury like a woman scorned? <laughs> heard that? Well, I decided, you know, I'm going to share that today, but I don't know who said that. So I'm going to look it up. So I Google. Who said, there is no fury like a woman scorned? Google says, a very insensitive man. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if he was insensitive or not, but I'll tell you this. He was more afraid of one pagan woman than he was 850 pagan men. In fact, he was so scared, he, he was so afraid, he ran from the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom. He ran for his life. And we see him, the first time we see this in his own life, and this is where you and I get into deep, 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 deep yogurt when we put our eyes on someone or something else other than God, we are going to be discouraged. He took 
his eyes off of Yahweh, and he put them on a pagan woman by the name of Jezebel, and because of it, he ran for his life. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I I want you to keep your place here because we're going to return to 1 Kings 19, but I want to share with you something that the Apostle Paul shared to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 16. Now, listen to me. This is very, very important. I'm going to give you just a few seconds to find a piece of paper, a pencil, eyebrow pencil, Crayola. I don't know what it would be that you can write on, but please understand that the shortest pencil is better than the longest memory. You may not need what I'm about to share or what Paul's about to share right now, but I guarantee you, very shortly, you're going to need this, okay? Not because this is my word, but because this is the word of God. So listen to me very, very carefully. You need this. Take some notes, and jot these things down. So here's what Paul says. He's dealing with the subject of walking victoriously in the midst of discouraging days. And let me tell you something. There was nothing more discouraging than living in Corinth when Paul helped to plant this church. And here's what he says in verse 16. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, for though the outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For a momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, but the things which are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, if you're taking notes, next slide, please. If you're taking notes... Here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand, to understand this, you have to understand this little slide. There are two governing principles that exist in the universe today. In what I call the heavenly realm, it is the principle of God's authority. Everything in the heavenly realm submits to the authority of God. But notice we drew a little line in between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. That's on purpose. I'm very visual in nature. So I drew a line there to show the distinction between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. In the earthly realm, when you and I, where we live, the governing principle on earth is the principle of Satan's rebellion. It should not surprise us the chaos that we are dealing with as a world because we are living with a world that has submitted itself not to God but to the prince of darkness. And because of it, it's like all hell is breaking loose right now. So understand that there are these two principles that are at work in your life and in my life, the principle of God's authority, the principle of Satan's rebellion. Next slide. I want you to notice that above the line... The spiritual realm, things are invisible, things are supernatural, things are timeless. Time does not exist in the heavenly realm. Let's look at the next realm. Below the line, the earthly realm, things are visible, they are natural, and time exists. How many of you have ever had a child that said, hey, mommy, how come God doesn't have a birthday? Or, hey, mommy or daddy, how can God just have always been? The only reason your child asks that is because your child is living below the line where time exists. In the heavenlies, time doesn't exist. Ladies and gentlemen, understand that with God, time is nothing, but timing is everything. Did you hear me? Time is nothing to God, but his timing is always perfect. So understand that these things are going on between these two realities. Now, let's take a look at the text. Next slide, please. That Paul gives us here in this particular text. And I want you to jot it down if you would. So he says, therefore, in light of what you've just read, we do not lose heart. Though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. So what is Paul saying? Paul is saying right now below the line, and anybody in here 30 and above is very aware of this. Your body is decaying. If you're a teenager and you're in your 20s, you don't get this yet. Hit 30. Once you get to 30, everything starts falling apart. And it doesn't get better until we go to be with Jesus. So 
But that's only going on below the line. Do you all understand nothing is decaying above the line? Shake your heads like this. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure you got this. There is nothing decaying above the line. But what is going on above the line is that we are being strengthened. This is where your strength comes from. This is where your joy is. This is where your peace is. This is where your fulfillment is. There is none of that stuff going on below the line. Then he goes on to say that below the line, our trials are working against us, but above the line, your trials are working for you. And then he goes on to say, he says, therefore, we do not lose heart. How many of you understand the fact that no one in the heavenly realm right now is depressed? I'm, I'm, I, y'all look like sleep. I'm getting like no head movement that you understand what I just said. I'm going to ask this again. Do you understand that there is no one that's depressed in the heavenly realm? There's no one discouraged in the heavenly realm. The only place that depression right now is taking place and discouragement is taking place is below the line. That's why he said don't lose heart. Because what's going on above the line is absolute sheer delight. Then he moves on to say, and you can't miss this one, below the line there is a momentary light affliction. Now I know what some of you are thinking right now. Losing a child is not light affliction. Having a spouse say, I don't love you anymore, is not light affliction. Losing your job is not light affliction. And I'm not trying to be insensitive. And the only way that we can see all the bad things that happen to us this side of eternity is by comparison. Paul says the only way for us to see the painful things that we go through is light affliction is if we are comparing them to the eternal weight of glory that awaits those of us who know him. The word here for weight means the substance of glory. And here's what Paul seems to apply. Please, please get this. The pathway, the doorway to us experiencing the the eternal weight of glory, which is the glory that we're yet to experience. I'm totally convinced that if we saw what awaited us, many of us would just think, hey, it's time just to move on out of here. But God put within us a will to live because God doesn't want us to be finished until he says, I'm finished with you. That weight of glory is glory that we have yet to experience. And I believe what Paul is saying is, is that the doorway to the eternal weight of glory is through the doorway of affliction. Because affliction is what God uses to purify us. God purges us. He makes us, molds us into the image of Jesus. So below the line, yes, there's affliction, but it has a purpose. Remember I said, above the line, your trials are working for you. On earth, they're working against you. So he's saying that this momentary light affliction is producing for us this eternal weight of glory. So our goal then is to experience the joy of this eternal weight of glory which is the transformation of our inner beings made into the image of Christ. That's what God's in the business right now of doing in your life. He is preparing for you a day that you will experience this glory that you can't even comprehend in your earthly body. But then he moves on to say, and I don't miss this, in verse 18 he says, while we look not at the things which are above the line or below the line, For we look not at the things which are below the line, because the things below the line are temporal. But the things above the line are eternal. And yet, think about this, folks. How much of our life today is given to the pursuit of those things that are temporal? Those things that don't matter. In 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, those things won't matter. We're pursuing the things that are temporal and neglecting the things that are eternal. So here's what he's saying. Above the line, you are in Christ as a child of God. Below the line, Christ is in you. Colossians 3, here's what Paul says. You don't need to turn there. 
Colossians chapter 3, Paul says, for those of us who know the Lord, we are dead in him, we are buried in him, we are raised with him, we are seated with him. Do you know what spiritual warfare is? Spiritual warfare is Satan attempting to disconnect you from the spiritual realm. Do you hear me? Listen to me. It's very important. Spiritual warfare is Satan attempting to disconnect you from the spiritual realm. He cannot do it positionally. For those of you who know the Lord, you're dead in him, you're buried in him, you're raised with him, you're seated with him. Positionally, he can't change that. But his attack on you will be experientially by trying to keep you focused on everything going on in this world below the line. I want you to think about something you're going through right now that's just depressing you. It's discouraging you. Is it something going on below the line or above the line? So here's what he's saying. You, you'd missed any of this up to this point. Don't miss this. Here's what Paul's saying. You and I have to function below the line. How many of you understand that till the day you die? Thank you. I just want to make sure you understand. We're going to live below the line until the day we die. So we have to function here. But don't miss this. Just because you have to function here doesn't mean you have to focus here. Where you and I get into real trouble is not only do we focus here, we're having to function here. And you can't function here and focus here and not be discouraged and depressed and maybe even in despair at times. Now listen, I know that there are people that have clinical depression. I know there are people that need medicine. I'm not trying to make light of that, but I am trying to say most people don't. Most people don't. And most of us, if we would just start applying this by the truth of God, this truth of God, it would mean that life would look very different. Elijah did not have this revelation, and because of it, he suffered three consequences. So let's go back to the text very quickly. Look what he says. Verse 9, he came to a cave and he lodged there. Number one, if you're taking notes, discouragement can lead us to forget about our responsibilities. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it's okay to run to a cave. It's just not okay to stay there. It's okay to rent a cave. It's just not okay to buy one. A lot of people love the cave. Woe is me. The world is against me. Because it's easier to have a pity party in a cave than to go out by the grace of God and to do what God's created you to do. Because just like Elijah, God created us to stand and to serve and to say, thus saith the Lord, not to sit and sulk and sour in some cave. You do understand that. I know we're all going to visit one occasionally, but staying there too long is very dangerous because you begin to forget the responsibilities that God has given you this side of eternity. When my doctor said to me, you've got leukemia, my first thought was my ministry's over. And God said, no, your ministry's not over. I'm going to increase your ministry. I'm going to give you more ministry. But a part of your ministry is going to be to cancer land, your oncology office. You're going to look for people in that oncology office who need me. And I'm going to give you opportunity to tell those people how great I am. So God did not take my ministry away. He simply added to my ministry. Now, how many of you think I wanted cancer land as my ministry? You can shake your head like this. It's fine because I didn't. I'm still not jumping up and down about it, but guess what? I don't get to choose what happens to me. I'm his. I am his. I bought into him hook, line, and sinker. You know why? Because the alternative isn't very good. Somebody asked me once, why are you a Christian? I said, well, many reasons. One is lack of good alternatives. <laughs> and so understand that we can get so caught up in ourselves and we whine and we moan, oh God, I've been serving you, I've got cancer. God, I've been trying to honor you, I've got leukemia. Stop asking God why he allows these things and ask, what do I want to do through that in your life? You see, sometimes you get to choose your ministry, sometimes God chooses them for you. 
Second of all, not only does, can't, does discouragement cause us to run from our responsibilities, but it causes us to point fingers. Look at verse 10. Elijah said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, the sons of Israel, who forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, God, you, only, you know the only reason why Jezebel is singling me out? Because I'm the only one that's living the righteous life. Nobody else is doing what I'm doing. And we hear this all the time. Nobody likes me. Everyone's out to get me. I don't have any dear friends. Let me tell you what I hear high school girls say sometimes. Everybody in high school is sexually promiscuous, so I might as well be sexual promiscuous. Nobody but me is a virgin. And folks, that flat out is not the case. But we whine and whine, and we make these little tiny molehills into mountains. It causes us to begin to point fingers and say, my dilemma is because of someone else. It's my mama. It's my daddy. It's my brother. It's my boss. This victim mentality is killing our culture today. Everything is everyone else's fault except our own. It causes us to point fingers. You see, some of you right now are thinking to yourself, hey, God, why don't you change my circumstance? I don't like my circumstance. When God's trying to say, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not changing your circumstance. What I'm doing is, it's even greater. I'm using your circumstance to change you. See the difference? Don't ask me to change your circumstance. Ask me to let the circumstance be my agent to change you. Then he moves on. Here's the last thing, and I'll sit down. It causes us to run from our responsibilities. He ran to a cave. It causes us to point fingers. He started saying, the only reason Jezebel singled me out is because no one else is living righteously. But then it causes us, I love this, to blow things out of proportion. Look what he says at the end of verse 14. I alone am left. I am the only one, God, who has not bowed a knee to Baal. He is blowing this way out of proportion. And I want you to look at God's response to him. Verse 18 is worth the price of admission today. You can't forget this, folks, because I think it's as applicable to Elijah as it is to you. I want you to look and see what God told him in verse 18. He said, Elijah, I have 7 thousand in Israel who have not bowed to Baal or their mouths kissed him. Elijah said, I'm the only one. God goes, son, no you're not. It's ridiculous. I've got 7,000. 7,000 who have not bowed to Baal or kissed him. Do you understand what God's saying to Elijah? And I believe it's the same thing God's trying to say to you this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, what God's trying to say is things right now are 7,000 times better than you think they are. Do you hear me? They're 7,000 times better than you think they are. My prayer is that God would allow us to live life from his vantage point to understand we're going to get through these days. God's going to get us through these days. He always watches out for his redeemed. He always takes care of his redeemed. Either he's going to change this or he's going to come get us. I'm telling you, that ought to give you hope. And it shouldn't discourage us when you look at a world that is hell-bent on the destruction of God and, and removing his thoughts from our mind because we live below the line. Take heart. We've won this. I read the final chapter. We do win. We really do. Keep your eyes above the line. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. It is fresh breath to us today. I pray, oh God, because I know there's so many people in this room that are struggling with so many things, and I'm not making light of them. I'm not. I know that life is heavy. I know it is burdensome. I know it is wearisome. But oh God, help us to keep our eyes on this eternal weight of glory that awaits us. 
to remember that you are at total control, even in a world that seems to be totally out of control. And we put our eyes on you today, and we focus on you today, and we beg you, oh God, to let us honor you in the world that we live until the day you call us home. In Christ's name, amen.